This is not an accident that the cost of education has gone through the roof in the U.S. It's really used as a monopoly device because that device allows people who are rich to essentially exclude from competition for best jobs the children of people who don't have that amount of money. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. Inequality within nations as well as between nations has received considerable attention in recent years. Very few would have predicted that a 700-page book on wealth and income inequality in Europe and the United States since the 18th century would go on to become an international bestseller. I am, of course, referring to Capital in the 21st Century, the 2013 book by the French economist Thomas Piketty. The global economy, according to the International Monetary Fund, is expected to contract 4.4% in 2020. This is bad news for the world's poor, whose numbers are expected to sharply increase. And a recent World Bank report has warned that more than 80% of those who will fall into the extreme poverty category live in middle-income countries. And many of the so-called new poor will be those living in urban areas and those that are relatively well-educated. But COVID has also made the world's richest even richer. According to data compiled by UBS, the Swiss multinational investment bank and financial services company, the world's billionaires have grown wealthier in 2020 compared with 2019. And this is not just in the United States or Europe, but also in Brazil and China. While inequality was rising in many parts of the world before COVID, the pandemic will most likely further deepen inequalities of various kinds. My guest this week is Branko Milanovic, one of the world's most well-known scholars on inequality. For almost two decades, he served as the lead economist in the World Bank's research department. Professor Milanovic is currently a visiting professor at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York and a senior scholar at the university's Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality. Professor Milanovic has published extensively on income inequality in individual countries and globally, including in pre-industrial societies. In this conversation, we discussed his 2016 book, Global Inequality, A New Approach for the Age of Globalization. But we also spoke about his latest book, Capitalism Alone, which was published last year, and in which he argues that for the first time in human history, the globe is dominated by one economic system, capitalism. So what then are the prospects for a fairer world now that capitalism is the only game in town? I hope you enjoy our conversation. Branko, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. I'm such a big fan. So thank you for, for finding the time to talk to me today. Thank you very much, Dan. It's, it's really, of course, a pleasure. And it's a pleasure to actually be able to get in touch and talk to people despite the, the virus. Actually, we are talking even more to each other now. Indeed. And, you know, I have realized that podcasts are a great way to reach out to people. And, and it is actually also making me read stuff that I had read before and making me read new stuff. And among the many books that I have is, of course, a whole collection of yours. And I wanted to mainly talk about two of your books, Branko. And 
which in many ways, you know, there are some overlapping themes and I'd like to explore with you one, of course, from 2016 on global inequality, a new approach for the age of globalization and your latest book from last year, Capitalism Alone. So let me start with perhaps you may consider this to be a rather silly question because you are, after all, the inequality guru. Why is inequality more relevant than ever today? Is inequality something that everybody agrees is a problem? Yes, I actually think it's an excellent question. And if you allow me, I will break it into two parts. Actually, the first is why has inequality become such a big issue? And indeed, it was not always the case, as one can remember, actually, like 10 or 15 years ago, it was really not a big issue. And it was not really much in public discourse. People didn't speak very much about that. Even in the World Bank, where I worked, the unit which dealt with sort of ostensibly with inequality was called uh, uh, poverty and equity. So inequality was a politically not an acceptable term. I think it all changed with the um, global financial crisis. And I think the reason why it changed is because the middle class in many Western countries, and particularly in the United States, realized that their growth rate, which they, you know, over the time, over time, was really very low, and it was actually masked by the ability to borrow. Once they had to actually start repaying, and of course the houses got repossessed, the, some of the jobs were lost, they became much more, I think, aware of the fact that the top 1% and generally rich people in the US have done extremely well. So at that time, the distance between them and the top became a political issue. And that's why I think inequality sort of burst on scene. So in my opinion, that was um, uh, the reason why actually inequality is now much more of a topic than, than it used to be. As I was uh, mentioning to you before we started the recording, even you know when we were a part of this trust fund and trying to get the World Bank to do innovative work on inequality, that it wasn't very easy. In fact, as you rightly say, it was often seen to be such a political question and, and the fact that the bank was going to do economic stuff that it was somewhat relegated. So it's, it's just really fantastic that you at least have been working so much on it. And the World Bank, of course, and the research department has shown greater interest. I want to um, get us started a bit by referring to the 2016 book, Global Inequality. I really enjoyed reading that, Branko. And what I found particularly interesting is, of course, on the very last page of the book, you ask the following question. You ask, will inequality disappear as globalization continues? End quote. And then you provide a very short and yet very clear answer. You say, no, the gains from globalization will not be evenly distributed. End quote. But that was 2016. And, and we will later discuss your most recent book, Capitalism Alone, which was published last year. Do we see the same kind of constellation in terms of the beneficiaries or who, you know, who lost out and who benefited from globalization? Because um, you are, of course, well known for many things, but one of them is that famous elephant curve where you basically identify that in the period 1988 to 2008, there were some people who, who benefited the so-called emerging global middle class in, in China and India and Vietnam and other countries. And many others, as you just said, the lower middle class in Europe and North America perhaps lost out. So, you know, in many ways, it appears that your 2016 answer still holds true. Is, is that a correct interpretation? Yes, actually, in, in the most recent uh, piece that I had, you know, finished only a few months ago, actually, I went back, of course, it took me much longer, and uh, there was really some sort of delays, but I looked at the period after 2008. So that was the period between 2008 and 2013 slash 14. So that was the next five year period. And uh, what is remarkable in that next five year period is that uh, the sort of the middle of the global income distribution, you know, of course, this is not only the middle, it's about like 30% of the population that are in the middle they have continued with high growth rates. And these are really, again, as in the previous period, period, these are people from Asia, of course, China in particular, but also India, Indonesia, Vietnam, all the large Asian countries. 
and even when we speak of the global financial crisis, really, it did not affect them. Uh, they continued actually growing over that period with practically the same growth rates as they had before, maybe some slowdown of one or two percentage points. And then the second uh, uh, important uh, sort of finding from the elephant uh, chart was that there was absence of growth at the higher parts of the global income distribution where most people from um, Western countries like, uh, but their lower parts of the distribution of individual Western countries were located. And that of course continued as well. So these two points really did not make any uh, change. There was no change in them in the next five year period. Uh, where you did, do no, did notice the change is actually at the very top, you know, the very top of the income distribution. And it's very clear in the case of the United States, actually uh, sort of registered significant losses after the crisis, and it took them about five years to recover. So since my period ends in 2013 14, they just basically they improved compared to the base year, but they improved very little. Now, it is quite possible that in the next period, which of course I don't include, which is a period from 2014 up to the current crisis, they have regained some grounds. But basically, this, the story and the structure remains the same. So then if you allow me, just let me just one more say one more thing so that actually people maybe understand this better. You know, the, the fact that the shape is the elephant doesn't mean that that particular shape would remain over time, even if the underlying growth rates uh, remain the same. The reason is as follows. As you have high growth rates around the middle of the income distribution, these people actually go up higher in the distribution and replace those who are growing slowly or growing at negative rates. So you would actually uh, have a significant inflow of Asian population, particularly of Chinese, into the top income groups. So the elephant is going to disappear as a shape, that's, that's for sure. But the underlying growth rates might not change. That is really interesting because in, in your work, you often highlight the fact that even though there, you know, this emerging global middle class in Asia, as you call them, even though they have benefited, they're not really very rich or they, they're still comparatively poor compared to the middle class in rich countries, right? That's true. And so that's one aspect. The other one is, and this is particularly, I suppose, relevant given the US elections, is making the connection between the gains that this emerging global middle class had in Asia and whether those gains are responsible for the so-called losses of the lower middle class in the United States and in Europe. Can you make that case as a politician that these, these two things are linked? You know, this is such a big issue and, you know, politically and very often, I think even emotionally, people really react very strongly to that. Uh, I honestly don't think that anyone can make a watertight causal case that the two of them are related. However, I think that uh, by sort of simply, or should I say by thinking, observing what has happened and sort of looking at the elements of empirically well, what we know has happened in particular i mean empirical studies that show the importance of chinese um, imports and globalization on loss of the purchasing power or jobs of the american uh, working class i think that we can make a statement saying that the two processes are related which does not mean that, of course, we should actually overturn globalization because globalization has many other advantages. But I don't think also that we should, uh, because we don't want to overturn globalization, that we should close our eyes and believe that these two things are really totally unrelated. You know, people who actually put the emphasis on technological progress alone would actually tell you, no, no, this is really what, what happened to the middle class in, in rich countries, in Western countries, is really the product of technological change. But you know, that technological change works within an environment which is defined by globalization. In other words, uh, ability of, you know, that you have to direct the production process in China or Burma or Tanzania is of course linked to, to, the, abil to the technological ability to control the, the, the process, but it's also linked 
to the other features of globalization, which means uh, that your um, uh, property, your investment there would be safe. You would be actually part of the same worldwide network of you know, uh, political and economic uh, institutions. So these are the, the global uh, forces, which I believe um, significantly influence even the type of technology that we use. So that's why I think that globalization did have something to do with these two developments, the growth of the middle class in Asia and the decline of the middle class in the Western countries. Just to continue with this point about the inequality among countries, Branko, in the 2016 book, and I'll come to, the, to your latest one soon, but in the 2016 book, you write that, and I find this really fascinating, you talk about the so-called citizenship rent, that if you're born in a wealthy country, you have an advantage. Yes. And in, in a sense, that's a rent, which is independent of a person's individual effort or their luck. And I feel that that in many ways resonates in a country like Norway, where I live, you know, there's the saying here that just by, and I wasn't born, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant here, uh, there's the saying here that if you're born in Norway, you've already won the lottery. Yes, yes. <laughs> so so is, is that something you feel there's more recognition for? Because in the new book, of course, you make this argument that one should perhaps erase that kind of uh, distinction, right, between citizens and non-citizens. And um... I, I think that actually the, the idea of the citizenship rent, which was kind of an implicit in writings of many people. And actually, when you mentioned, of course, that being born in Norway is actually a sort of a winning a lottery. Uh, in my original paper, I used a quote which comes from Cecil Rhodes as an epigraph. And uh, he said uh, something to the effect, oh, young man, to somebody, obviously speaking to somebody, you have won the lottery of life by being born British. Of course, it's obviously true, you know, look at the 19th century being British and actually being at the bottom oftentimes of the British income distribution on a scale. Uh, and then you simply go to countries in Asia and Africa and you suddenly become rich. And uh, I mean, you know, I've been, of course, working with income distribution data for a long time, but talking about being rich, I recently sort of looked again at uh, data from 1927 from Kenya. That was actually because of Obama's grandfather, because Obama mentions in his book the, uh, the wage of his grandfather. And, you know, the uh, extraordinary thing, of course, in many of these countries is the gap which existed between the Europeans and the domestic or native population. And we're talking about gaps which are like, I mean, average incomes, which are by the, the range is like 10, I mean, 50 to 1, not 10 to 1, but 50 to 1, even 100 to 1. So clearly, there was, of course, uh, Cecil Rhodes was right. Now, that continues today simply because the mean incomes of the countries are very different. But the interesting part about that is, and actually, it was really political philosophers who made me think about this, because this is the issue which they highlighted. The economists totally ignored it. And what political philosophers found interesting in my work is that for the first time, they actually could see some numbers, you know, put on that. Um, and uh, then it raises really some really important issues of which they have been thinking is uh, uh, whether that particular rent uh, is justifiable. In other words, uh, when you look at, for example, within a country, when you look at somebody who was born in a rich family versus somebody who was born in poor family, the presumption or prior is that actually that should not affect the life chances of one child versus the other. And we try actually to minimize such gaps by, you know, taxing uh, inheritance, taxing uh, high wealth, uh, uh, having public education, really two things that Rawls emphasizes in his book, really public education and taxing of inheritance in order to equalize opportunities. But when it comes to a global inequality, we do nothing about that. Because obviously argument is that there is no global governance, there is no actually participation of citizens in, in something that they jointly participate. There is no common endeavor actually. So there may be justification why we should do nothing, but you know, we have to make that justification and we have to think about this. And I think it's important to put it on the table. I'm not arguing that as I said, we should really treat it 
uh, uh, the same as we treat the uh, wealth differences between individuals in a given country, but we have to sort of discuss it and to see whether it is really, whether it is fully justifiable or not. Let's move on to inequality within countries, Branko. And one of the many overlaps, or a, a sort of a, um, a common thread in much of your work, at least these two books that I'm referring to more specifically, is the concept of the Kuznet waves or cycles that you discuss. And this, of course, refers to the Kuznet's hypothesis that as countries industrialize and average income grows, inequality will first increase and then decrease. But you find that this, of course, can't explain the kind of increase in income inequality in, in the United States or in, in other rich countries, in Europe, etc. And so you talk about and you distinguish between these so-called malign forces. And I quite like the fact that you actually talk about pandemics. You mentioned epidemics in 2016. That could be malign, it could be wars and natural disasters. And you talk about benign forces like education, social transfers, and taxation. But these appear to be particularly relevant now in, in this COVID era. What, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I'm actually glad that you asked the question about the Kuznets uh, waves, because there is a little bit of a background which is sort of unfortunate for the Kuznets uh, hypothesis. When Kuznets defined it in the mid 50s and then the early 1960s, Actually, you know, he actually had very few data points, but the idea was was quite clear. You know, there is technological change. There is a, ch a movement from the agricultural sector into the manufacturing and industrial sector, uh, increasing income inequality or income differences between people because the jobs are very different. And then at a certain point, there will be a peak and then the forces which would be the forces of education, which would reduce the premium that, of course, highly skilled people would get. And then the forces of much more abundant capital, which would reduce the return on capital, would then push inequality down. And we tried, in many people actually tried in the 1970s and the 80s to look at that. The results were quite mixed. But one of the reasons why they were mixed is because we didn't have longer term series for individual countries. You know, it is an irony that actually, well, not an irony, but it's a fact that we now have many more data about the past than, of course, people who lived in that past. And even the data from 1970s are more plentiful now than they used to be in the 1970s. Simply because we go and actually research the, the, the past data and look at archives and so forth. So then when you actually look at Kuznet's uh, uh, idea over longer term for countries like the US, the UK, uh, China, Brazil, you do actually find that it does pretty good job until around 1980s for the rich countries like US and the UK. But then after that, of course, with the increase in inequality, it doesn't do a good job. However, if you take his logic that there will be changes in inequality, systemic changes in inequality that would be unleashed by technological change and by the structural change in the economy. For example, the transfer of labor from manufacturing and industrial sector into services, you can apply the same logic that he applied in the 1960s and say we are now going through another wave. So I think actually that we have too easily rejected uh, his own thinking because his own thinking was based on observing one wave. He didn't think that we might have two or, or maybe we'll have three or five, but I think that the original idea was uh, quite sound. And that's why actually I brought up the, uh, the Kuznets uh, waves. Uh, however, I have to say that, uh, you know, in his case, when he actually spoke about uh, the forces that would uh, uh, reduce inequality after the first wave, it's kind of more difficult now to see what are these forces. I mean, we can, of course, replicate what he said. There are maybe a few others that we can put together, but, you know, they are not as straightforward as they were when he wrote uh, uh, that in 1960s, when he actually basically believed that the abundance, as I said, of skilled labor and capital would reduce returns to both of them and actually then reduce um, income inequality. 
Branko, coming to, you know, this latest book of yours, Capitalism Alone, you argue that capitalism has won and is basically at the peak of its power. It is now embraced by almost all countries of the world. You write, we live in a world where everybody follows the same rules and understands the same language of profit making. And that this kind of mastery of the world by capitalism involves two types. If I can paraphrase one, of course, you call the liberal meritocratic capitalism, basically Western forms of capitalism about how goods and services are produced and exchanged, how they're distributed and you know what kind of social mobility we have in society. And then you contrast this liberal meritocratic capitalism with political capitalism, which is more state-led authoritarian capitalism versions we see in China and Vietnam and Rwanda and Singapore and Ethiopia, etc. But before we begin discussing these two main models, Branko, I wonder what really is the main implication of this victory of capitalism? Has this victory come at a cost, such as rising inequality and growing populism? Yes, it's, it's a good question. Let me just first uh, sort of address the, the very beginning of, of your question, Dan. So it was because oftentimes I'm actually asked that and people with some sort of incredulity look at the fact that I emphasize the, the victory of capitalism because, of course, you have lots of books written about the crisis of capitalism and so forth. I look at that from a very empirical point of view. And of course, I noticed that all the countries, and including China, and we will come to China in a minute, but all the countries basically follow the same principles. As you said, actually, uh, we all follow profit. We understand that language wherever you are in any part of the world. And we organize production in a very similar way, you know, privately owned capital, hired labor, decentralized coordination, really the three uh, sort of defining features of capitalism. Moreover, and that's the last part of my book, capitalism has really made significant inroads in the new areas where actually uh, commercialization was not present until very recently, like our private lives and so forth, you know, Airbnb, um, ability to actually uh, sort of use leisure in order to make money and so forth. So, you know, empirically, I think these two things really are true. You know, geographically, capitalism had never been more powerful. And even in our own private lives, we have become what I call the sort of capitalistic machines. But did it come at the cost? I, you know, that's a very difficult question. I think that the cost is uh, um, the fact that the uh, capitalist system, I, th I think, actually has to be amoral in order to, to function the way that it functions, because it has to put at the pedestal of its uh, values uh, maximization of profits within the companies and which is of course related to that is really maximization of private wealth which then leads to respect uh, a feeling of self-worth you know self-importance admiration by others uh, if that stops then essentially the the engine of production stops so that could be a cost, you know, the cost may be, maybe it's actually, as I mentioned, inevitable cost uh, built into the human condition is that on the other hand, we can become richer, but on the other hand, we cannot really, uh, we lose certain of the values which we had before. So that could be the cost, you know. Obviously, there may be some more practical costs, as you mentioned, actually, inequality. And I think there are some good arguments. There is a very nice paper by two Brazilian authors. Actually, I mentioned them to be Brazilians precisely for the reason that they are, were far from the influence of the Soviet Union and, and communism, but they actually argue empirically that countries that were the socialist and communist parties were stronger, trade unions were stronger, and that were even geographically closer to the Soviet Union had actually less inequality. Meaning, which I think is kind of a defendable proposition, that in order to for self to sort of do self-preservation, uh, many of the sort of extreme capitalist traits were uh, muted during the period, I suppose, from 1945 to 1980 and certainly to 1990, and then they were unleashed. You know, Piketty's capital in the 21st century has 
some of that implication that he doesn't of course single out communism or the Soviet Union, but it does have the implication that capitalism now is back to where it was at the end of the 19th century in this kind of open uh, sort of uh, acceptance of uh, I mean, greed, profit making and so forth. So I think that could be the inequality could be a cost of, of this victory too. You know, I've been interested in the relationship between democracy development and poverty reduction. And um, and so I was thinking when I was reading your latest book about the relationship between democracy and inequality. And when we talk about these two major models of capitalism, I was just wondering how much more inequality does the liberal meritocratic capitalism produce when compared with political capitalism? Can you say that one produces more inequality than the other? I, I wouldn't actually say so, because if you look at, and of course it's simplifying things, but I actually simplify them in my book, as, as you know, then I looked, of course, at China and the U.S. as sort of exemplars of the two, which I think is acceptable. Let me just parenthetically mention if, you know, Marx was studying capitalism, but he was studying capitalism mostly on the example of England, you know, if you look at the his books and capital is actually, I would say probably 95%, well, 90% of the data come, France actually plays some role too, but really come from from uh, from England or from the UK. So I think it's also acceptable to use US and China as, as an exemplars of the two. Uh, and, you know, Chinese inequality is very high, actually. Technically, it is actually higher than the, the US inequality. So I don't think that political capitalism really uh, can uh, sort of advertise itself to be better than liberal capitalism on the grounds of less inequality. What it can advertise itself, and I think I mentioned that in the book, is that it might claim that it has a, a better organization, like, for example, an efficient bureaucracy and uh, administration that allows for the achievement of higher rates of growth. It can also argue that uh, by sort of not accepting uh, impediments that often come from democratic decision making, which actually sort of postpone many decisions over for a long time, it becomes much more effective and efficient in, ra in raising living standards. So I think it can claim these things. I don't think it can claim to be doing better in terms of inequality. I don't think he can claim to do better in terms of corruption. So um, these would be the features that I would not see as, um, as sort of uh, clearly in favor of one or the other. Actually, just to complete that, I mentioned at the very end of the book, as you know, that you have certain similarities in the case of the liberal or the US type of capitalism, you have a political power which is more and more taken by people who have economic power. In other words, they actually are able to control the political process. And in case of China, you have the opposite with the same effect, the opposite in the sense that you have people with political power who through their family or friends actually branch out into the economic sphere and then also unify political and economic power. So there are also similarities in that respect. I found your uh, discussion on China fascinating. I've enjoyed reading any, any work that you have on China. And I'll, and I'll ask you some more questions about that. But in the book, of course, you talk about, you highlight land reforms, you talk about you know, the bureaucracy, you talk about private sector dynamism in China, the fact that law is perhaps applied generally, but there is no rule of law in China that applies to as you were saying, you know, certain people are beyond the arms of the law. And so there is corruption. But what you do highlight is state efficiency. You talk about the fact that there is tangible and visible development taking place, which in many ways perhaps explains why certain levels of corruption can be tolerated. Have I understood you correctly? Yes, yes, you have actually. I, I, I think I, that... Um... What is interesting, I think, in the China type models is also uh, the autonomy of the state. You know, I mentioned that as one of the three characteristics of the political capitalism, the first being an efficient bureaucracy, the second being, as you mentioned, actually absence of the rule of law. And the contradiction between these two is where corruption actually springs up. 
and the third characteristic being autonomy of the state. Now, I've read some of the Chinese history, and uh, I think this the, the role the autonomy of the state goes back to basically formation of the Chinese state. You know, Fukuyama may, uh, calls it the precocious state formation, and uh, the state was all well seems always to have been independent or autonomous from the influence of organized groups like merchants, trade, I mean, merchants, uh, bourgeoisie, capitalists, and so forth, which was not the case in Europe where these groups were able essentially to control the state or take over parts of the, of the state. So I think that's a, that's a difference. And I think, of course, the question is actually to what an extent this is replicable elsewhere. Uh, but I think to many people that autonomy of the state might come as a, a sort of an a, appealing feature, especially if this is linked or found necessary for economic growth. So I think this is an important feature of the of the political capitalism. That the, uh, and we see that you know that essentially the decisions that the state makes are not decisions that are necessarily sort of uh, uh, influenced by people who might have most money or who are actually most powerful capitalists, you know. Most powerful capitalists in China are still very much under the control of the state. One of the things I was a little uncertain about in this latest book, Branko, was what your thoughts are on corruption and fighting corruption, because you seem to allude to the fact that some level of corruption is fine if the state is efficient. Is that how you see it? Yes. That, they, they, that there is actually a beneficial uh, relationship between corruption and development, that corruption can promote development and welfare, and, but, but maybe it shouldn't exceed a certain level. Yes, I, I, it's a very tricky, uh, you know, subject. Uh, but I think we tend to sort of take a sort a, a priori position that corruption not only is bad in some kind of moral or ethical sense, but it's actually bad for economic growth. And on that second point, I was not totally convinced. You know, even by empirical studies, it's difficult actually to to figure this out because there are so many intervening factors as well. Uh, but I thought actually that some types of corruptions might lead to a kind of an equilibrium uh, where you either have a petty corruption which allows you to do certain things much faster than you would have done otherwise, or actually in a more recent book that I actually reviewed is uh, by uh, by Yang Yang Eng. Uh, she's a professor at uh, political sciences in, in the U.S. Yeah, she's going to be a guest on my podcast in a couple of weeks. Well, you will see actually see her views. Of course, she has written the whole book about the corruption in China. And she actually believes that certain types of corruption are really sort of growth enhancing. Now, of course, she says they are, grow they are a little bit like steroids. You know, they actually make <laughs> you feel better for a while, but then there are certain costs over the time. And it could be, but I think that actually we have to take a slightly more, uh, uh, how should I say, more nuanced view uh, on corruption. Again, I'm just saying that from a purely growth perspective, uh, not from the ethical perspective. And I, to be quite honest, I think the economists are not really in the business of ethics. We are in the business really of growth, poverty reduction. That's not ethics, it's not our, uh, you know, field. It's, let me just say that actually I was sometimes criticized when I study inequality. People say, well, you inequality doesn't matter because people are basically who are concerned about that are people who are envious. But, you know, again, there too, you know, we are not judging that. We are just, if people are envious, we take it as a, as a given. We are not going to sort of morally judge them. It's, it's not our business to do that. It reminded me what you just said about an article I read by Pranab Bardhan many years ago, where he makes the case that um, what is really important in terms of corruption and development is whether bribery is centralized. So if you have a centralization of bribery going to the most important people, as he, I think, pointed out in, in relation to Indonesia, where Suharto mm -hmm. and his cronies got all the money, then it could actually lead to something positive for the, for the country. Whereas, and I think you use India as the opposite case, where bribery is, was then much more decentralized, 
you know, if, if, if it's petty corruption and policemen getting small bribes, then it doesn't really help. Do, do you agree this kind of centralization of bribery? Who gets the money is, is important? Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure, actually. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Bardon has a very nice piece recently on, on social democracy, actually, very interesting, very long piece, which I really liked very much. Uh, but on this centralization, I'm not sure what I actually like. Let me go to Ang's book. Actually, what I like is that she empirically tries to actually uh, tease out the differences between, she has four types of corruption, and then puts different countries in different sort of niches, as it were. And India is in a different niche from China, and China is in a different niche from the US and, and Russia. So it was interesting, but I think in her case, it was really uh, uh, the sort of the link between corruption and decision-making on on large projects or actually important projects, which was she argued was um, important for um, acceleration of growth, but not. I don't remember. I don't think it was really centralization versus decentralization. Maybe that's another aspect that was. Uh, but having said all of that, I think let me just put what would be my conclusion. It's not that I have an answer whether it is this type or or the other type, which is useful. I just think that we are basically, we should empirically research, and that's why I like her book, uh, research corruption as we research other phenomena, not start with a sort of a prior saying, well, we have really to get rid of all of it. And I think also what her book, let me just say that actually, I, what I think what the book is interesting also in uncovering the hidden, the concealed ways of corruption in so-called transparent societies, where because they often what they do they, as the U.S. does with the, with lobbying, they legalize corruption, and then you say, well, it's no longer corruption because we have legalized lobbying. But you know, it's not very different from not legalizing lobbying. So you know, I think actually that that book is also very good in that respect. It actually shows us that the prevalence of corruption is much greater. Thanks so much for advertising one of my future episodes. That, that, you've done a very good job of that. But staying on the China issue, Branko, there are, of course, all of these concerns that China is exporting its version of political capitalism abroad, the China model. And I remember reading a few years ago, um, and you write a bit about it in the book about the Belt and Road Initiative, but a few years ago, you had this piece in The Guardian, I think, where you where you said things like, well, the West is doing all of the soft areas of development, mm -hmm. but China's doing the hard stuff, you know, with the infrastructure that the West has, has neglected. And referring to a former guest on my podcast, Jude Moore from the Center for Global Development, he, a couple of weeks ago, you know, we were discussing how the West has this tendency of criticizing China in terms of what China's doing in Africa and elsewhere, but it doesn't really come up with an alternative, you know, to the BRI. There is no state-led Western alternative. So in many ways, you know, I'm just wondering, has, have your ideas developed since that Guardian piece? In the book, you mentioned the BRI as being important. I'm just wondering whether when we, when we just talked about corruption mm -hmm. and, and this kind of concern that Western powers have, that, you know, all this emphasis on good governance and anti-corruption is just going to go down the drain because China is becoming more and more popular are you, are you in Africa, in, in Asia, etc. Are you worried about that? Um, no, actually, I actually think that the Chinese role is, is generally positive. But before I say that, I, actually, I agree with you when you mentioned, and this is something that I discussed at the very end of the uh, chapter three on China, uh, that China does have a problem of packaging its model. You know, when you have... Uh, big powers, like let's suppose we go back to the Soviet Union and the USA, they had two products which they were packaging uh, to, for export. You know, it was very clear for the, in the Soviet case, it was really one party rule, centralized uh, bureaucracy, large investments, uh, five-year plans. It's, it's really sort of a package, and it's, it's very clear. The US is of course also very clear, more or less the opposite of what I just said for the Soviet Union, decentralized, uh, coordination, uh, private sector, decision-making by, you know, individual companies and, and individual people and so forth. Uh, China does have a problem that it does not have a package that is kind of easily transferable elsewhere. 
And I think that gradually they are maybe developing that package. And I actually tried in my book to, by sort of putting together like main characteristics of that to some extent to, to create this package. And then the next question is whether China would be willing to export that package. So uh, uh, the, the export of Chinese political capitalism is really under big question mark for, for these reasons, you know, that it's not easily transportable and transferable elsewhere. Uh, now, the role of uh, Belt and Road Initiative is to some extent to help that, you know, not only to help China economically, but also to help China politically have an influence around the world. Uh, and now that, of course, if it comes with acceleration or better growth performance in many countries in Africa, I see this really as really a big plus. Uh, Europeans see it as a minus because they basically see China as a geopolitical or strategic competitor. So whatever China does and whatever you know increases the influence of China in Africa is for them a bad news. But it may not be a bad news for Africans if they actually are better off because of Chinese uh, investments. And I think it also raises the issue whether the West really should continue as it has been doing for the last, actually since the end of the Cold War, with these soft um, types of uh, development. And let me say that the, I don't see that this is actually an accident that the West has actually moved, like if you look at the World Bank, has moved much more toward this sort of soft um, uh, development types. And when the money is dispersed, it's actually basically dispersed as a sort of money that the government, it's at government discretion how to spend it. It's not really dispersed on individual projects. And the reason for that is that during the Cold War, again, the, uh, the, the West did not want to go too much into the politicization of aid in the sense that, that it would actually impose conditions which had to do with political developments. It really tried to make it very neutral. So if you build a dam, if you build a road, if you build, uh, build a sports um, whatever facility, it's neutral. It's just the fact that you have built that, that stuff. But when you actually start imposing conditions which have to do with the organization of your government, with corruption, with the representation of civil society, then you become politicized. And that's actually what happened. And that's what West, the West could do after the end of the Cold War. It couldn't do that before. So I think that development is not just development which happened out of the blue. It was really a politically motivated development. And uh, uh, quite honestly, I don't see that uh, as particularly useful for many of those countries. And let me just say that I don't see it also useful because I've seen that that the so-called NGOs that are being sort of celebrated or they were celebrated are oftentimes simply a lobbies, lobbying groups that were oftentimes hijacked or, you know, by the most powerful layers of the urban population that uses that as essentially as a political party. You know, I've been looking into this, I've been studying, interacting with Chinese policymakers, African policymakers, and I think there are three sets of issues here that I think China has going for itself, you know, even though you're, you're right that China perhaps doesn't package it correctly. One has to do with referring to its own track record of solving poverty. Or they still say that they have 200 million people who are poor, but they say, you know, we, we solved the hunger problem and we reduced poverty. So you can learn from us. So it's this kind of South-South kind of exchange, which is much more appealing than coming from a, a Northern country with, you know, where one doesn't one can't really relate to these uh, western experiences so that's one set the other has to do with um, the fact that they come with expertise and 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 they're highlighting infrastructure that the west has as you've also argued before neglected and finally is the non interference principle right that you know whatever you do we're not going to come in and preach and I think that is appealing. And there are many problems to it, but at least I feel that, and I don't know if you agree, my, my argument is that the Chinese are diplomatically far more superior in Africa in sort of articulating their model than the West is, because the West doesn't seem to say, we want something from you. The Chinese say, we want this from you. It makes people feel important. Yeah, I totally agree. I think there was a certain amount of fatigue with uh, Western preaching. You know, it has become really sort of tiresome. Uh, 
uh, because that breaching goes on for like now two decades or three decades. And oftentimes it's a total in total contradiction with reality, even with reality in the Western countries, you know. And non-interference, I think it's a very strong um, uh, point uh, that, that China has. Uh, and actually what is also, I think, happening is that the Chinese influence is making now Europeans and the Americans pay much more attention to the countries where China is trying to sort of project its sort of influence or power. And if you cleverly use and leverage the Chinese influence uh, to get more money or more sort of support from the West, that's actually pretty clever policy. So uh, the, the fact that, that China does exist, I think in some cases is helpful for the countries also to, to get noticed and to sort of get more support from uh, the other side. Uh, so I, I actually, that's why I say uh, on, I see it as a, as a plus. I see it also as a plus for Europe, which I think Europe has not come to appreciate, is that if China does have a role in Africa and helps African growth, it would also, over the long term, reduce the migration pressure from Africa into Europe. So Europe might also like the idea of Chinese uh, sort of uh, role in Africa for that reason. Since you mentioned Europe, let's move to Europe, uh, where the welfare state in, in some parts of Europe, you know, is struggling, is under pressure. And you write about this in both books that, you know, reducing inequality in rich welfare states is is something that uh, people are, are worried about. And you argue that what worked in reducing inequality earlier, like increased taxation, social transfers, nationalization of property, and even wars, will not work now. And uh, what you need is something different. Interventions that are undertaken before taxation, transfers that kick in before, you know, at a much earlier phase. And, and you talk about, and I'd like you to please elaborate further on this, you talk about the importance of focusing on the inequality of endowments, such as ownership of assets. And you talk about equalizing meaningful access to education. Can, can you please elaborate further on, on these thoughts? Yes, it's actually it's a great question. I, I have to say I, I'm really quite, uh, how should I say, disappointed by the lack of vision that you often find now among people who are in favor of social democracy, but they really would like to turn the clock back to, to a world which to some extent is imaginary, but to the part that it was not imaginary, the world of 1960s and the 70s, uh, it really cannot be brought back. I recently had a piece in, in, in Social Europe about that, and I had in mind really concrete cases, uh, like, for example, Paul Collier's book, The Future of Capitalism, some of uh, uh, Paul Krugman's writings, um, uh, Strake's writings uh, about also, you know, the the like les trente glorieuses, like the sort of the uh, return to the social democratic past, but that past cannot be recaptured because the conditions are now entirely different. Uh, as you said, actually, that that depended on very strong trade unions, depending on on increase in education. You know, education number of years of education in Europe after World War II was, I think, you know, five to seven years on average, and it became thirteen or fourteen years of, of, on average. And it depended on high taxation and transfers. And if you look at these four uh, tools, uh, trade unions have declined everywhere, and they have declined for the endogenous reasons. Is that actually the nature of jobs are very different now than they were in the past? You know, there is no more Fordism. You know, with two thousand people in the same you know large factory sitting together, working together. Uh, then you have uh, education, which actually in many respects has reached uh, sort of its own limits. We cannot really get from education simply increased number of years of education. We cannot get what we got from, from that in the past. And taxation is really limited by the unwillingness of the uh, middle classes to pay tax rates, which are on average above 50 percent, and by the inability of the governments to tax certain types of income because of their mobility, especially, you know, capital income. 
So there are really limits to what we can do with the old tools. And that's why I suggest, as you mentioned, uh, a change in emphasis, which means change into endowments or what you can call pre-redistribution. Because let me put it in a very extreme way so that people can very easily understand. Let's suppose that all our endowments, which means how much of financial capital and housing we each have, and what is our level of skills or education, let's suppose that they are relatively even. Obviously, they would never be totally the same, but let's suppose they are much more even than they are now, where you have 90% of capital assets in the hands of 10% of people. So let's suppose that they are like that. Well, in that case, you really don't need much of taxation nor transfers to equalize outcomes. So, you know, at some point, you can have actually very low taxation if your underlying endowments of assets and human capital, so to speak it for, to call it like that for a minute, are more or less equal. And I think that should be the, the, the new vision of social democracy. And if you have that vision, then you have two policies which really sort of stand out immediately. And these policies are equalization of financial, especially financial assets that people have, which means, you know, shares, uh, all uh, housing as well, and others, financial and housing assets. And when you look at that, then in, the implication of this is that you should have tax advantages given to the middle class in order for the middle class to actually become much more involved in the uh, stock market and in, in actually and in having financial assets and workers' ownership. So these two elements really are directly derivative from that particular approach. And the second element, or maybe the third element, which is derivative, is the education, where I what I mean is access to the same type of education, implying that education to education that would give you very high wages in the future. So in the other words, we do have now the same access to education, for example, in the U.S., in the sense that everybody can go to school. There are public schools, and you actually, to go, in, to go for some of them, you really don't need, even need much money. But the point is that these schools are not going to give you very high wage after your graduation, because the schools that would give you a high wage are the schools for which you have to pay millions in order to get there. Yeah, I, I found that uh, very interesting. You say that it's not just it's not just about accessing education. I mean, a four year degree in one community college versus in an elite Ivy League university. It is all about what society prioritizes, right? I mean, or, or considers valuable. So, getting a degree from a prestigious university gives you the network, gets you higher wages, whereas the same education from somewhere else, cheaper, does not get you that access. I think that's crucial. And actually, this is used, uh, used really, and that's why I think, again, this is not an accident that the cost of education has gone through the roof in the US. It's really used as a monopoly device because that device allows people who are rich to essentially exclude from competition for best jobs the children of people who don't have that amount of money. It really works exactly like that. It's and for them, for the really the rich people, uh, actually increased cost of education is a plus. It's not a minus. It's actually a plus because the higher the cost, the less competition your children have to face from other people. And uh, uh, then essentially what you have, you have technically equal access, but the outcomes are entirely different. So the implication of this is really public education, public education of the top kind. So in other words, if you have a public sector, public education sector being superior to the private education sector, private education sector could become like what used to be like the sort of finishing schools in Switzerland, where, of course, rich people send their kids because, you know, they need to graduate into something. But really, nobody pays much attention to them. Uh, and in order to do that, it's not really so difficult. It's all a question of money. If you were to go to uh, public universities that the U.S. actually did in the past, had excellent and still does have very good, but it could have much better. If you pay, you know, professors like uh, much more than they're paying, they're being paid now, they would all move. They would move from, you know, Yale and Stanford. And if you pay them twice as much in a, in a, in a public, you know, they would all move. So if they move, then, of course, these schools would actually become the schools with the cachet, 
So they would be the ones that would produce uh, people with high, who would actually then command high salaries in the future. I have to ask you one final question, Ranko, because in capitalism alone, you propose certain measures to combat inequality um, for future societies. You talk about tax advantages for the middle class. You talk about more funding for good quality schools. You talk about limiting private funding of political campaigns. But what you do not agree with is this growing call for cash transfers under this umbrella of universal basic income. And you, you, you appear to mm-hmm. be very skeptical. You say, oh, there are very few cases, you know, Finland, and, and I've, I've seen some of those cases. Uh, you talk about right. the enormous cost. You know, we don't really know. We don't have much experience. You say it could actually erode the guardrails of the welfare state. But I just want to ask your final view on this. I mean, are you dismissive of universal basic income? Can you see that it could actually have an important impact somewhere down the line? No, I'm not entirely dismissive. Even if you read that, I have, I think, four arguments against uh, UBI. And, uh, uh, but I'm not uh, sort of fully rejecting it because I see some advantages. And I'll come to that in, in a second. Uh, you know, I do see the disadvantage first that actually that system cannot really go together with the current system. You know, there are actually, you cannot fund these two things together. And actually, we do have in the current system, we have the floor and social assistance is supposed to sort of do that function. Uh, of course, it's not the same as the UBI, but, you know, you cannot have the uh, both of them. Secondly, I think that actually very often, people who are very rich and who actually really would like to have high inequality and nobody questioning their income uh, are very much in favor of UBI because they essentially say, well, okay, I will be in favor of UBI. Everybody can get that amount of money, which is probably not very high, but because you cannot afford, uh, but then don't ask me anything else. So just go get, get your money, do nothing, but don't ask me for any redistribution. And I think actually that attitude and of course high inequality is bad for other reasons, including control of the political process and so on. So I think that UBI could actually lead to the situation where we have further disconnect from social obligations of the rich. So that's one of the reason, of the four reasons. And another one is that, uh, uh, that I really sort of have some doubts about a society where you would actually have maybe 10 or 15 percent of people being able to live without working because they have high, you know, property income, and then you will have maybe 10 or 15 percent of people who would not work because they would actually be happy just to sort of quasi live on. I mean, quasi. I mean, they don't live greatly, but they kind of live like hippies, I'd say, in, on on UBI. So you know, can you really have like 30 percent of the population really not working? Is it a good society? Is work really something which makes us human or not? But I have to say that with this crisis, it has really slightly changed my opinion because in this crisis, we had to actually use ad hoc measures to make the purchasing power and income of uh, people who have uh, who have lost their jobs or danger of losing their jobs be maintained. With UBI, of course, you would have an automatic stabilizer there. So, you know, in in crisis conditions like this one, uh, I agree and actually mentioned that UBI would be would be a good, um, a good mechanism. So I'm not entirely, you know, I'm not entirely against it. I have still these doubts that I mentioned, but they have been lessened somewhat by what has happened now with, with COVID. Branko, it was so fun to chat with you today on this Saturday morning, afternoon in D.C. and evening in Norway. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much, Dan. It was really a pleasure. I really enjoyed it very much. And thank you for inviting me. If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the news among your friends and share it on social media. The Twitter handle for this podcast is Global Dev Pod. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo's Center for Development and the Environment. 
please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.